Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian opens by introducing us to the character of the child or the boy that we're going to follow throughout the book. Uh, this young, this young character without a name, who navigates the American West and sees just horrors after horrors and and the carnage of that landscape. In the second paragraph of the book, uh, we have a description. We have a, a quote from the father of the boy. We get this image of the father sort of lying in a drunken stupor. We we're not told that the father says this. But based on the context, uh, it seems like it's the father who's saying this. Um, if it's not the father, then it's, then it's Cormac McCarthy saying this. Quote, Night of your birth, 33. The Leonids, they were called. God, how the stars did fall. I looked for blackness, holes in the heavens, the dipper stove. End quote. So the Leonids is a meteor shower, which comes periodically, like every 20 or 30 years or so. Um, it's like a really dramatic meteor shower. And the description of the birth of the child, 33, the Leonids they were called, the sense of the cosmological is so important in this book. This is a book about uh, travelers, people who um, just sort of traverse the open space of the American West and the Mexican borderlands. And these are people who are sleeping outdoors. And the sky, the night sky, the lights of the sky in this era before electric light, of course, plays such an important role in their lives. It's something which gets imbued with all sorts of meaning and superstition. G.K. Chesterton is a writer, uh, mostly of Christian apologetics, who thought a lot about this question of mystery, the sense of enchantment, of wonder that one might feel when looking up at the night sky, when looking up at a meteor shower. For Chesterton, there's a real danger that we fail to see, we fail to appreciate the mysteries of our world and the sense in which we live in a, in a haunted world, in a world which you might say is enchanted, is incomprehensible. A quote by G.K. Chesterton. The real trouble with this world of ours is not that it is an unreasonable world, nor even that it is a reasonable one. The commonest kind of trouble is that it is nearly reasonable, but not quite. Life is not in the logicality, yet it is a trap for logicians. It looks just a little more mathematical and regular than it is. Its exactitude is obvious, but its inexactitude is hidden. Its wildness lies in wait. End quote. A very similar idea is expressed by the character of the judge in Blood Meridian. The judge is an incredibly bizarre character, an incredibly compelling character. His, he looks bizarre. He is massive and doesn't have a hair on his body. He's one of Cormac McCarthy's great psychopathic characters. He's like a absolute psychopath. And he's also totally brilliant. Um, much smarter than any other character in the book. Describing the character of the judge, uh, two other characters come to mind as if the judge is sort of like a marriage of these two. One is the Joker from Batman, which is just this like maniacal... Uh, reveling in evil and reveling in destruction, and the other is, is the devil. You have this brilliant and mastermind kind of fiend who also uh, promotes all sorts of evil and destruction. There's a scene when Glanton and his company of mercenaries are camping out together in this empty, vast expanse of the desert, and the judge talks to uh, the company, he talks to the people, and he says, quote, The truth about this world is that anything is possible. Had you not seen it all from birth, and thereby bled it of its strangeness, it would appear to you for what it is, a hat trick in a medicine show, a fevered dream, a trance, the populate, with chimeras having neither analog 
nor precedent. An itinerant carnival, a migratory tent show whose ultimate destination, after many a pitch, in many a mudded field, is unspeakable and calamitous beyond reckoning. End quote. Cormac McCarthy writes incredible descriptions of this landscape, of the night sky. Uh, the one we just read is, you know, the dipper stove, meaning the Great Dipper, breaking apart. I, I looked for blackness. Uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't find blackness with all the, the meteors uh, in the night sky. Just really compelling, gorgeous descriptions of a mysterious, and again, I would say almost haunted and enchanting kind of landscape. One Chesterton quote, one last Chesterton quote that I think really captures some of the effect that personally I get when reading this book, that I think a reader can get when reading this book, is as follows. Quote, One of the deepest and strangest of all human moods is the mood which will suddenly strike us, perhaps in a garden at night or deep in sloping meadows, the feeling that every flower and leaf has just uttered something stupendously direct and important, and that we have, by a prodigy of imbecility, not heard or understood it. There is a certain poetic value, and that a genuine one, in the sense of having missed the full meaning of things. There is beauty, not only in wisdom, but in this dazed and dramatic ignorance, end quote. When Cormac McCarthy describes the landscape of the American West, and he describes these characters, these mercenaries, very often he uses dreaming or hallucination as a metaphor, as a description for this scene and for this, the experience of, of being in this setting, in this landscape. So here's one example. Quote, They diminished upon the plain to the west. First the sound, and then the shape of them, dissolving in the heat, rising off the sand, until they were no more than a moat, struggling in that hallucinatory void, and then nothing at all. The riders rode on. End quote. So this is an example of hallucinatory void. Another really beautiful Cormac McCarthy description. Quote, the shadows of the smallest stones lay like pencil lines across the sand, and the shapes of the men and their mounts advanced elongate before them like strands of the night from which they'd ridden, like tentacles to bind them to the darkness yet to come. They rode with their heads down, faceless under their hats, like an army asleep on the march. End quote. One last Cormac McCarthy description. The thunder moved up from the southwest, and lightning lit the desert all about them. Blue and barren, great clanging reaches ordered out of the absolute night like some demon kingdom, summoned up, or changeling land, that come the day would leave them neither trace, nor smoke, nor ruin, more than any troubling dream. End quote. The sense of dreaming, of hallucination, I think captures the way in which these characters seem to be perceiving the world as though through a filter, through a fog, a fog of their mind. But another characteristic, another implication of this language is a sense in which the agent, the individual, constructs their own reality. What dreams and hallucinations have in common is that they're interior mental phenomena in the sense that their images, their visions, their perceptions, which are conjured up in a person's own mind and sort of projected out onto the world. And I think that's a sense that we get in this book, a sense of hallucination, a sense in which the characters are, in a sense, authors of their own experience. A very explicit example 
of this sense is in a scene very early in the book. The kid and Sproul, who's another young character, are alone in the desert and their company has been wiped out by Indians and they're on the verge of, of dying from dehydration and they, they see a mirage. Uh, they previously saw some water in the distance and since uh, it was a mirage, the next day uh, they don't see the water anymore. So Sproul says to the kid, what happened to the lake? And the kid responds, I couldn't tell you. We both saw it. People see what they want to see. Then how come I ain't seeing it now? I sure as hell want to. The most dramatic example or description of the way in which human beings can author and construct the reality also comes from the judge. In the book, there's a scene where Glanton's mercenaries are traveling through the desert in this completely barren, empty expanse, and they hit upon a camp, a small encampment of peaceful travelers. And they see that this small encampment was wiped out by Indians or people who disguised themselves to be Indians. And this, this band of mercenaries, they, they look at this empty desert and they see these two paths, these two trajectories that collide in the middle and they intersect in this emptiness and one just destroys the other and leaves a total horrendous, grotesque uh, place of destruction in the middle of the desert. And, and the characters wonder how bizarre is it that you have this convergence and not only that you have a third vector a third convergence which is this band of mercenaries also walking in this empty desert coming across this intersection and it seems so unlikely it seems so unreasonable that this would happen by chance quote Notions of chance and fate are the preoccupation of men engaged in rash undertakings. The trail of the Argonauts terminated in ashes, as told, and in the convergence of such vectors, in such a waste, wherein the hearts and enterprise of one small nation have been swallowed up and carried off by another. The ex-priest asked if some might not see the hand of a cynical god conducting with what austerity and what mock surprise so lethal a congruence. End quote. And so again, they see this intersection and the ex-priest, the character of the ex-priest says, is this the doing of some cynical god, of an evil god? He continues, quote, the posting of witnesses by a third and other path altogether might also be called in evidence as appearing to beggar chance. Yet the judge, who had put his horse forward until he was abreast of the speculants, said that in this was expressed the very nature of the witness, and that his proximity was no third thing but rather the prime for what could be said to occur unobserved. End quote. And so the ex-priest says, this is so unlikely, this convergence of three vectors in the wilderness, this destruction, and the judge says, no. This convergence is the prime thing. Nothing happens unobserved. That by observing it, by encountering the destruction, it's as if we brought it into existence. There are many ways to think about constructed realities, mental constructions of reality from a philosophical perspective, from an ep epistemological perspective. But I think one of the senses in which this is very relevant and accurate and compelling 
is that in a psychological sense, often the experience of witnessing horror can give a feeling, can create a feeling of culpability. I think often people who see traumas in war, and certainly this is a book about trauma, a book about horrors, people who observe these things often have the experience that they're not just morally culpable for what they do, but they're morally culpable for what they see. And of course, reading Blood Meridian gives us very direct experience of that impression.